Thank you, everyone, for coming. Welcome to the final seminar of the CSOX seminar series, Southeast European Realities Amid Europe's Multiple Crises. Uh, this seminar is uh, entitled Political Legitimacy in Crisis, Reflections on Romania, Macedonia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, my name is Robin Smith. I will be chairing what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting uh, panel. Uh, I myself am doing a DPhil here in anthropology uh, in the late stages of writing up uh, my thesis on uh, business relationships and political activities of winemakers in uh, Istria, Croatia. Uh, today, our speakers will present in turn about how Southeastern Europe is coping with the political and economic, uh, with different political and economic crises. Uh, Romania, Macedonia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina have all recently experienced massive public protests against the political establishment, questioning the legitimacy of their respective political systems and behavior of politicians in a myriad of uh, ways. Gruja Badescu will present on Romania. Uh, he is a departmental lecturer in human geography here at Oxford, as well as a stipendary lecturer at St. John's College. Uh, his <coughs> PhD at the Center for Urban Conflict Research at uh, the University of Cambridge examined the relationship between the reconstruction of cities after war and the process of coming to terms with the past, focusing on Belgrade and Sarajevo. Uh, he has also considered the uses of public space for protest in Romania. Uh, Cviet Koneska will present on Macedonia. Cviet is a senior analyst for Europe and uh, at Control Risk Group in London, uh, advising governments and companies about uh, political and security risks spanning Europe. She completed her DPhil in politics here at St. Anthony's College in 2012 with a thesis on political elites in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia. Uh, she is the author of After Ethnic Conflict, Policy Making in Post-Conflict Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia. Uh, and finally, Jesse Horonoshova, uh, who will present on Bosnia and Herzegovina, is a DPhil candidate here in politics at St. Anthony's College and an associate researcher here at CSOX. Uh, her research focuses on reparations for civilian victims of war and veterans in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She has worked in the media sector in the Balkans, the OSCE in Bosnia, at the ICTY in The Hague. Uh, as well, she is author of Everyday Ethno-National Identities of Young People in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as uh, co-editor of The Nexus Between Democracy, Collective Identity, and uh, the EU Enlargement. So each guest here will speak for approximately 20 minutes, after which we will open the floor to questions. Uh, I only ask that to keep things rolling along, we keep questions to the end unless there are points of clarification. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Gruja. Well, thank you very much, Robin, for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much for coming today. And uh, for me, it's, it's quite, um, quite an experiment to, uh, to reflect back on, uh, on events in Romania after, after a long time in which my attention was more into, into uh, the, uh, our, our neighboring former Yugoslav republics. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, thought exercise, not only that I was interested for a long time in public space and, and how that plays a role in, 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 in protest, and, and Bucharest in uh, particular has been quite a stage for that, but also um, to kind of create links and, and think between processes that can unite our countries. But we can, we can actually discuss that a bit, a bit later. So I will start um, actually with um, a quite emblematic image of something that happened last year in the, in the autumn, uh, just at the end of, of October. Some of you might be familiar, but uh, at the end of October, in, uh, in one quite uh, popular nightclub in Bucharest, there was, a, there was a rock concert. And that rock concert brought um, hundreds of people and what promised to, um, to be the launch of, um, uh, of a new rock band, uh, rock album for a band called Goodbye to Gravity, but also they, they promised in, the, in that show to bring um, some form of um, pyrotechnic um, um, effects, a form of fireworks. And those fireworks, um, unfortunately, set the acoustic uh, foam on fire. And uh, the result were many people who died uh, straight away, others who died later in, um, in um, the in hospital, and there was uh, also an effect of um, of toxic gas um, exhumed exhumed by by people. There were uh, people who tried to, to get out in a, in a very very uh, small uh, exit door. There were people who, who were blocked inside. There were emergency services which appeared at one point. There were overcrowded hospitals and and, and over and sh uh, uh, staff shortage in that night. And then one after one after one, various political leaders made statements, and then. Um, the second day, 
the city was silent. And um, it is um, a sea of candles that, that this is a, a place in a sort of collective club that took, um, took over as a, um, as a visual image of, of the silence in a city that is rather uh, a noisy one. But this particular collapse of this particular collapse of of, uh, of the club tells also another narrative, a narrative of state collapse, which was brought together by a form of, of by a form of protest that came later, and by by various claims and various narratives that from uh, that went from a micro event, you know, um, if you if you think of um, uh, that concept in history about. Uh, uh, event that uh, of total history in which all the forces and all the agents, all the actors are kind of uh, mobilized together. So let's walk a bit through this this event and what happened in its aftermath and, and see how what story of uh, a crisis of political legitimacy tells about Romania. So first and foremost were the victims. The victims uh, were mostly young people whose faces suddenly f flooded uh, various media channels, despite some families not wanting that. Um, it happens that two of the people there um, I happen to to have known rather well, and we celebrated New Year's Eve together just two, year, two years before. And uh, some people did not have personal connections to, to the dead, but uh, in in that day, the number of phone calls, the number of, of discussion that, that suddenly emerged, connecting diaspora communities with the with the local communities, people started thinking, "What about my son? What about the possibility of my son, my brother, my mother, my..." My sister being being there, and then, after after a day of, of silence, people took the streets in what became the largest street event in the history of Romania after the 1999 revolution. And uh, in 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 these um, this um, and you can see that also the, the imagery connected with um, with the revolution, which a Romanian flag without its socialist emblem at the time um, was then brought and brought back in, in, into this protest by saying that this is a, re a revolt against a form of, of a system. So there are, a number of, there are a number of key points that this protest will, will bring. So the first one is the anti-systemic anti one. What people were, were, were seeing in this event, and the reason why they went out, is that the, the collapse of, uh, of the club through fire showed a number of problems with, uh, with the way that the state uh, was, was run in, in Romania. For some of them, it is not only a story of, of uh, permits, of construction permits, of le of, or of authorization of leaving one, per one building which had a small mm -hmm. fire exit um, to, to function in, um, in its capacity, but uh, it was about having um, a problem of coordination, uh, even though the, the, the emergency um, <coughs> forces came qu quite fast and, and they are kind of, kind of a symbol of positive, uh, positive institution in Romania. But it was about what kind of country do we live in uh, was some uh, um, was something frequently uttered, in which permits can be just given so so laxly, in which things can happen, in which our doctors are all far away because uh, because of uh, very very low wages, in which the state itself, through its withdrawal from various parts of of, of life uh, of life from se from security to to uh, to, uh, to economics, from healthcare to education, created a, a form of collapse. Even though R Romania is now in the European Union, and so. What um, what this went together is what, is when one particular syntagm called corruptia uh, uccide, which, for those speaking Romance languages, means uh, corruption kills. So they put everything into one word: corruption. A word which was frequently uttered in the last in the last years. In fact, a word synonymous with the, with, the, with Romania's succession to the EU battles. Corruption was what, uh, what became emblematic for, uh, for the rotten state in, in Romania. It was a word which captured and brought in uh, everything. It was a word that became synonymous with a system. But uh, what is interesting that this corruption and, and this system led to, to, this, uh, to one particular call, a world without politicians. For, uh, for Romanians who are, who are in the squares, the entire political system was in, uh, embodying corruption. And so what they were saying is that, OK, beyond the, the funky name of uh, a movement called Zeitgeist, I don't know what up with that. But uh, the, the idea is that they were saying that the future has a collective author. So what's interesting in this first point about the system is that while people were contesting the, the politics, they were 
very much engaged into, a, uh, into the political. So if you use the French terms, le politique, la politique. They were, they, were, they were really discussing the political while rejecting the contemporary politics and the political system that they, that they saw as problematic. This, this collective author were the people, as opposed to, um, to a, a system of parties, which they, they found, first of all, ideologically um, inept, but not representing any form, um, any form of left or right, even if their names would be social democratic, democratic liberal, national liberal, there's a, some of a, of a perception among, um, among many uh, Romanians that in fact the, the, uh, these parties are somehow cliques of, of individuals, even though if you look at the, the platforms, they actually are assembled around um, carefully uh, worded political um, positions. And, and, and so a lot of caricatures will appear, we're saying the Romanian political parties, we think we're thinking in the same way, we're lying in the same way, we're stealing in the same way. So this is just a way of, uh, of, of showing that the political spectrum, the politi uh, sorry, politics, the political system was, uh, was becoming synonymous um, with, um, with corruption. And this is something that is not new. Uh, because if you look, for instance, at, at, at previous protests, and it's a protest in the uh, International the, in the Transparency City of Cluj, uh, about um, um, one event that really focused the attention in previous years, which was one um, Canadian-owned uh, gold mine, in, uh, which was supposed to be open in, in Transylvania, where, uh, for which the government at the time issued, um, issued a decree which permitted that company to expropriate land from, uh, from, uh, from local residents, which was seen as a way of the state collapsing in front of, uh, of uh, business interests. You can see that the dimensions of this protest were, were way, uh, way smaller. However, the, the discussion was also about anti-system. The discussion was even that revolution will start from Rosia Montana. Rosia Montana is, is the name of that, of that place. So the, the system and, and idea of so system corruption, while asking for a different form of political help, have been on, the, um, on Romanian minds for quite a, on particular Romanian minds for quite a, a long a time. And what's, what's interesting is that while people were, were asking for a different form of politics, a particular uh, group among the squares uh, um, in Bucharest, Cluj, or other cities in the, in the more recent uh, protests, were asking for this particular <coughs> apolitical concept, a technocratic government. They said the, the solution would be for our political crisis is apolitical. We have to get people who are technocratic. Of course, te technocracy since uh, um, for, for a long time has, uh, has issued discussions of what is actually, what is actually political. Um, and so what, how apolitical is technocracy, especially when this te technocracy would come um, with um, particular agendas and connected with particular, particular uh, um, interests. I'll bring here now a, another, um, another aspect, the idea of the messianic figure. So while people rejected the, the system and the political party and somehow the way of, of, of that form of democracy. Um, when um, the elections a couple of years ago um, occurred, Klaus Johannes, um, a, for, a former mayor of uh, Transylvania city of Sibiu, an um, ethnic uh, Saxon German, and a uh, member of the Liberal Party in that, in, that, in that case, ran with a platform, a very, also with a messianic message, uh, in which uh, when he won, after a very interesting election, but we can discuss that in the Q&A, he said, we won, we took the, our country back. So then there was a lot of enthusiasm, and, and so the messianic figure promised a change in, in, the, in the politics and in the reality, everyday life of, of, of Romanians. It's interesting, in the collective uh, affair, uh, aftermath, the president comes into the street, is in the, middle of, um, in the middle of the people, and somehow echoes historic figures of the 19th century, like Kuza, who would come and, and, be to, uh, and kind of take the pulse of the, of the crowds. And in this case, he asks the people to, uh, to come with a plan um, what should be done. And so then the uh, whole series of consultations with the civic society happen. And this, com and this is when um, one of the questions comes, oh, uh, to what extent were consultations or discussions or, or this particular democratic um, ideals of the, of the square actually re reflected, um, reflected um, ordinary Romanians' concerns. So uh, for, towards, um, towards the end of um, of this, I would like to suggest a form of geography of, um, of, of protest, for understanding from the micro to the macro what's actually happening and what kind of representation do we discuss here. If you look at the micro, this is something that uh, just uh, um, uh, appeared online, looking at the square and, div and div just seeing what kind of groups were in that square. In fact, there's no such thing as a homogenous voice of the people. And I'm not to, I can go back to this in the Q&A of um, a kind of humoristic take on 
how you have here from uh, from um, liberal groups to uh, the G, like normal people from all the social zones, to people who are um, like dubious, uh, dubious people with the uh, corruption kills, manipulators, um, people with who talk um, who would be pro-church, anti-church, nationalists, uh, anti-nationalists, uh, uh, um, queer activists, all together, but all together, but all separate in in the way they they dealt with this, and they all had different claims, and then only. A, a particular group was invited to, to discuss the traditional civil society. The, and the whole discussion of the civil society, was, um, what is a civil society, was brought in in Romania, again, bringing traditional forms of looking at the political system in, into doubt. What is the, the civil society in this case? If you look at the macro level, this is a map of the elections um, uh, where Johannes won. And you can see here a quite, um, quite striking divide between, not red states and, uh, and blue states, but between the people. Uh, so, um, Look, places where um, um, people voted for Johannes were usually either in, in the former Habsburg Empire, some people said, but actually if you look, it's more correlated to rural and urban. And the people who voted against, uh, against a liberal uh, reform and voted with the, the Social Democratic Party, seen by many in the square as a, uh, as a culprit for a form of moral corruption of, uh, of the country, where for others, everybody else, everybody together was, was culprit of that, um, the, the ones who voted for that, for that party were the rural, the, um, the dispossessed in, the, in, the, in various former mono-industrial cities. And so this is a voice that was not in the square, and it's, and it's always a problem of what is the political, what, how is the political represented when in fact the red is not really part of this conversation. And just to, uh, um, I'll, I will, for the interest of time, even the messianic figure is, is being um, delegitimized uh, uh, lately by a, by a number of, uh, of interventions in which he defended to a, a TV station that was considered to be um, by a particular group in that square as against political reform, uh, while uh, in the, in, so a lot of trust is, is, is placed by many particular liberal elites in, into this divi national division of anti-corruption, which is seen as, as somehow leading Romania, so a, an a apolitical um, so judicial board, which is actually is arresting politicians who, are, who have been corrupt for a long time. There are some uh, commentators in the New York Times even called it a, 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 a more Jacobin revolution than, uh, than, than the French. <laughs> and so what is, um, what is interesting here, if we, if we are to, um, to bring together all, the, uh, all these points, is that on the one hand we see how, uh, how the geographies of, of protests particular, um, favor particular voices, create Huge masses of society which are which are invisible in the in the political process, they they claim that the political has to be reformed, but actually they propose a techno technocratic solution, which is actually now now in uh, now in place. And also, um, what is also interesting is that today, um, this social movement that happened there is almost forgotten. The the discussions are are again back in the in the rudimentary mundane conversations uh, uh, on the on the political system while people are still dis disgruntled, as very much as uh, as uh, I'm sure Jesse will talk about about Bosnia. It really mirrors uh, the, the, um, the cycles and uh, and um, some key moments in which various constellations of actors emerge and then they leave. But Romania is still in search for its for its political soul, and it's um, and the crisis of political legitimacy is very much ongoing into a into a general perception that politics is, is dirty, politics is ugly, which most people will, will, will talk on an everyday, everyday case, while being afraid of stepping in, except in this magical moment somehow, which come from because of particular immediate causes, and, and which they channel um, democratic energies and agonistic, let's say, um, agonistic urbanism at the end of the day. And I'm looking very forward to questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Gruya, and I'd like to turn the floor over now to Sveta to continue on uh, Thank you Macedonia. Very much. Thank you very much. I, I did not bring a PowerPoint with me, so you only have me um, and, and my notes from my notebook. But um, thank you, Gruya, for that. That's a lovely introduction. And um, I think in many ways, if I can try from the very beginning to relate to your presentation, the Macedonian case is actually quite the opposite of what happened in Romania. But maybe we can try and then draw some general conclusions at the end. You got me thinking uh, a little bit when you said the collapse of collective nightclub was like a symbol, a symbolic sort of 
even into the collapse of the state. Well, in Macedonia, what happened when the opposition revealed the recordings of wiretap conversations between government officials was the opposite. It was not symbolic. It was rather a revelation of, you know, if you wish, the real of politics. This is exactly what it looks like when politicians in government talk to each other over their mobile phones when they think no one is listening. So the whole mystery of government, the whole mystery of politics was sort of taken down and the people were faced with the real. There was no space left anymore to pretend that politics is less corrupt, less interest-driven, less, if you wish, crude and vulgar than what these conversations revealed. There was no point in, in pretending that you know the, the emperor's got nice clothes on when the emperor himself or herself was admitting that they were naked. So virtually it was the reel of politics presented there to the citizens of Macedonia who otherwise anyway knew that the political elites are corrupt, that they're very often incompetent and that they're also not very much respectful of the rule of law or even of the kind of general norms of, of decent human behavior. But presented with this evidence, there was no space not to act anymore. So something had to be done. And that was the only time, the first time since Macedonian independence, which was quite an eventful event, it's on its own declaration of independence, when more than a few thousand people got together in the main city square in Skopje and, and asked for something to change. So um, in that sense, again, if you look at what happened in Macedonia, I think the bottom line is not, not much has actually happened or as much changed. The people's opinions of politics and politicians have not changed. They now, now, not only do they guess, now they're certain and there's actual evidence that politicians are corrupt, that they're only there for their own personal interest. And they, while looking after their own interests, they also do not flinch at all at violating all the laws, including the constitution of the country. Um, what that means for political legitimacy was that obviously it, it only shows that um, there's absolutely no legitimacy, that people don't perceive the elites as very uh, legitimate. Um, but that was the case, that was always the case in Macedonia. No politician, uh, except for a very short period of time, has been very popular or perceived as, as, as very legitimate, holding legitimate claims, claims to government. So what we are seeing is actually not a crisis, but rather some sort of um, undermining the, what was an equilibrium of living in a state with the lack of political legitimacy. Now the position that, that, that the previous equilibrium was untenable because something clearly has to be done given all this evidence. But what, what we see is not necessarily push to increase political legitimacy to change to change the system. And I'm not sure how much that is the case really in Romania either, and we can discuss that later. But rather, I think, is a, just a reaction by the citizens to find another way to, to establish some sort of balance in between politics and society so that everyone can go on doing their, their business, politicians running the country and looking after their interests and, and citizens, you know, trying to survive. Um, and also, you know, not 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 get too much on the wrong side of authorities in Macedonia, but that is more difficult than it's than than it sounds. It doesn't sound like a very ambitious claim. It doesn't sound like a claim to have another revolution. Macedonians are not very revolutionary people, uh, but it's not as easy as it sounds because when when you look at the situation, the question that 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 is. A lot of people who are observing the, the situation, like myself, but I suppose a lot of people in the country too, would think, so where will the solution to this crisis come from? Who is going to, to, to drive this change in society? And, and that's not something new. Obviously, Macedonia has had troubles with, with getting political problems resolved previously. 
uh, notably in 2001 when there were ethnic when there was an armed ethnic conflict between um, Albanian armed groups and Macedonian security forces so some solution had to be come and be found and in that case the solution came from outside so there was external mediation and, and, and external actors helped the country reform, overhaul the political structures and then move on further. Uh, but it's not that easy to take the same route this time round. And there are a couple of reasons as to why that, that is the case. Um, first, since I started already talking about external actors, external actors are also suffering from a lack of legitimacy in Macedonia. Uh, while the EU and NATO, to perhaps lesser extent, were seen as, as the potential saviors to, the, to Macedonia in 2001, and um, offering, offering a solution, a prospect of EU and NATO membership, which in the eyes of many, including the, the elites, could have moved the country further along the transition process closer to the European mainstream, I think that belief is all but completely gone now. I, I don't think there is much of a, well, the EU doesn't really hold much clout anymore in Macedonia. Whatever legitimacy it, it used to have, it, it's now all but gone. Uh, partly that is obviously due to the fact that Macedonia has been a candidate state for more than 10 years and, and not a single you know, step forward in, in, in those uh, 10 years, which is largely due to what the Macedonian politicians have done in those 10 years, but also due to the EU's inability to find a way to move Macedonia forward. But also because of the problems of, of the EU itself, the EU of 2016 is not the same as the EU of 2001. And uh, so, while the same kind of method is being used again by the EU, by sending special representatives and mediators to talk to the elites, to come find some sort of a compromise, uh, these people are hardly seen as the people who are going to bring the solution to, to Macedonia, not by the politicians and definitely not by the public. So, while they can still to a certain extent use uh, sticks and carrots uh, when when getting to to mediating negotiations between politicians you know their their space for maneuvering is narrow is significantly narrowed down so uh, external actors can still help to a certain extent but they can't provide the solution and obviously the solution can't really come from politicians themselves because they are the, the cause of the problem and, um, well, not only the government politicians who are obviously implicated uh, in all sorts of illegal and criminal activities according to the, to the recordings that have been re released, but the opposition itself. And you would imagine that uh, in the face of such allegations and, and in those uh, recordings that were revealed, uh, that the opposition's popularity was going to soar. But that didn't really happen in Macedonia. And it's not very surprising, given that um, the opposition had not won elections, not because people really thought the government was, was not corrupt and doing a good job. That was never the case. So, again, nothing really changed in the perception of, of, of general people. They also know the opposition politicians, just as the government oppositions and this is again something similar to how people perhaps view political parties in Romania. They're seen as equally um, incompetent or corrupt. Perhaps there's a degree of, you know, it's a matter of, of kind of scale differences, but not really the fundamental nature of their politics is not seen as, as significantly different. So that is why I think and perhaps some in the opposition were surprised that the popularity didn't really increase and I don't think if elections are held in the next few months, they're likely to win them. Um, rather, I think that the ruling party, regardless of, of you know, all the scandals, is still likely to win, win the election. And the reason for that, I claim, is that not be people didn't vote for them because they thought they were doing a good job, but out of fear. But that's a completely different uh, discussion, which we can pick up later. The point I was trying to make is that the solution can't come from politicians themselves, and obviously it's because they 
lack, they have completely lack legitimacy, there's no public trust in them, and because they are the problem, so they can't really provide the solution. So what we're left with, again, is perhaps civil society, and that, again, is a perhaps similar to what happened in Romania, but I think in the Macedonian case is, is, is even more poignant and because um, civil society is even weaker, it is very weak and um, is not seen as particularly more legitimate than politicians. This is largely due to the fact that um, a lot of the larger civil society organizations are funded by foreign foreign funds. That doesn't help their reputation, definitely not for the past 10 years during the Vemero led governments when there had been a sustained effort to portray such organizations as working toward some other foreign interests rather than to the national interest. Um, so they don't really, they haven't really engaged very much with the state and the state institutions over the past 10 years. And um, everyone else, apart from select few organizations who could afford uh, foreign funds, have been colonized by the parties, which means by the ruling parties, and do not really provide a separate kind of interlocutor in a conversation about what to do about politics in Macedonia. So trying to carve out a political space, independent space in Macedonian politics, from where to start thinking about solutions and from where to start rebuilding political legitimacy of the system is very, very difficult, which is why we are stuck where we are in a situation, in a limbo situation where neither the government has properly resigned nor we have proper elections arranged. It's all about <coughs> just discussing political scandals and who did what, but there's no actual solution being debated, no actual proposals as to what exactly needs to change and how in order to avoid repeating these mistakes in the future. And unlike, or maybe again in a way similar to what's happening in Romania, this there's one effort to carve out this independent space and it comes from a a relatively technocratic mm. source, and in this case is the Special Prosecutor's Office, which was established as part of the agreement reached between the government and opposition to investigate the claims made during them the, in the in the wiretapped conversations. And um, the Special Prosecutor was elected by consensus from both sides, so uh, she she's and she is guaranteed by that somehow a uh, certain degree of independence and she's expected to to investigate all the alleged crimes she started her work it's a woman just like the dna head in romania so maybe that's a good sign um but there are, <coughs> well, well it's promising what she's done and what her team have done so far there are a couple of caveats i'd like to flag up regarding their work the first one is that um the special prosecutor, who's meant to basically investigate everything and put ev the truth out there so that we can then move on, um, she can only really do her job properly insofar as she's supported A, by the political parties and B, by external actors. And already she has faced pressures by the ruling party, by the institutions and ministries who are refusing to cooperate and provide the needed information. There is no way for the special prosecutor herself to go and obtain the, the needed evidence and, com and information if institutions don't cooperate. So there is a potential threat there that this might, special prosecutor might not investigate very much after all. And the second and perhaps not as immediately obvious threat regarding her work concerns the fact that this body is not actually rooted anywhere in the constitutional system in Macedonia. There, there's no special prosecutor as such provided in, in the legal system, in the constitution. This is a kind of ad hoc body whose relation to other institutions in the country is not really, really certain. So basically she was created as a result 
of an agreement between political party leaders. That is not, that, that, there's no legal and constitutional basis to, to create an institution whose decisions and actions in the end should have um, executive and legal consequences. And um, uh, several people, several uh, uh, lawyers must not have, have brought up this, these concerns and it's something that may lead to her decisions in the end being questioned or disputed in front of the constitutional court of the country and basically their whole work invalidated. And, and this, you know, might seem like a small problem if she reveals the truth and if people know the truth. So it doesn't really matter in the end if the sentences are upheld uh, by, by the courts in the country. But I think that is exactly the where her contribution should be. Because as I said in the beginning, the truth is quite obvious to everyone in Macedonia. No one really doubts that if, if you know, government ministers were being corrupt or if the police was being used to intimidate people to vote certain ways or, or whatever other ways, um, the law was being, being not respected. That's not a question. It's not a question of truth. It's a, it's a question of actually people facing consequences. And I think that's exactly where we see a potential threat of the special prosecutor not delivering. So I think with that, it seems like we have exhausted the potential sources for solution in the Macedonian case. And I'm not being very optimistic here, am I? But um, there are very few other sources from where a solution, solution can, can be found. And um, I think though the, the, poten the, 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 the potential kind of deadlock is already obvious because um, while there are, there are elections coming in a couple of months in Macedonia, hopefully, um, there is no, and you would imagine that politics is in big crisis given everything that's been revealed. The, a, the public opinion polls do not indicate any significant change of, 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 of public uh, loyalty to the, big, to the big parties, whether Macedonian or Albanian parties. And, and be no new project has really been even mentioned in the public sphere. Someone using all this kind of commotion and mobilization of, of the public to create something new, to, to, to create a new political subject. The left political discourse remains completely di discredited and no one is, is picking that up, even though there's a lot of space there to explore. Uh, the two parties, the main opposition party keeps on recycling its its rhetoric about EU integration and so on, which is it's not very appealing to the electorate. And obviously, the, the main conservative parties just stick to their nationalist um, nationalist rhetoric and policy. So, not much seems to seems to have changed. And I think the tactic appears to be uh, waiting out for the storm to pass and for things to just return to to business as usual, which is not very. Uh, very encouraging, but it just goes on to show that um, that perhaps uh, not not every crisis of political legitimacy can give you know, can give rise to some systemic and structural changes in politics. But not to conclude my my talk with on an entirely negative note, um, the one thing where I think this um, the past year has potentially created change and, and space for more change is regarding um, ethnic inter-ethnic relations. And does sound a bit counterintuitive, but it has been the one occasion where people have mobilized on the streets regardless of their ethnic um, ethnic background and uh, regardless of, of you know which group they belong to, even uh, kind of more positively stated and, and, and used both Macedonian and Albanian flags together during the protest against the government. So basically trying to say, look, even the Macedonian system is set up so that we mostly talk about ethnic issues, there are instances where we can get together and demand some other changes. So. Um, and this is positive in two ways. A, obviously, it creates space and goes to show that even in a divided country like Macedonia, there is still possibility for mobilizing across ethnic uh, 
um, ethnic uh, boundaries, divisions, which is good in itself. But B also goes to show that the institutions, the way they are set up, um, despite a lot of criticism, I think they have not entirely extinguished all the kind of cross, um, cross group cleavages and have got the potential to have political subjects which speak to both groups, or well, at least the two large ethnic groups in the country, uh, which means that um, perhaps Macedonia is not doomed to forever just be, be prisoner to ethnic divisions and inter-ethnic politics entirely. Uh, but as I said again, how much of this is likely to happen and when is not obvious right now since such a political project that would bring together people with concerns across ethnic lines is not yet articulated, let alone established or, or being formed. But I'll, I keep my, I'll keep my eye on, on the situation. Happy to discuss, discuss it further. Good. Thank you so much. You want to switch places? And maybe Jesse will have something. Right. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for being actually the last speaker of the seminar series, which Adis and Otto put together. So thank you very much for the invitation, and it's glad to see my friends on the panel. So my topic is on the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and listening to your presentation, I thought that I probably should have started, because I have, uh, I'm trying to give you a very broad picture about how I understand legitimacy in crisis in Bosnia, uh, and not only about protests, but also other things. But also listening to you, there are so many similarities with the, with the Macedonian case, and again, uh, less so in the case of Romania. But I guess we can, we can discuss that in the Q&A. So the outline of my presentation is I first br briefly want to talk about legitimacy and how I'll actually understand it in this presentation, and then the various sources of political power in Bosnia, because it's quite complex, it's even more complex than in the case of uh, Macedonia. And that then is going to give me the background in, in order to be able to evaluate uh, how domestic governments and public views of governments actually play out in the country and then we can uh, have the Q&A session. I'll try to be as brief as I can. So in terms of legitimacy, there are so many conceptions and conceptualizations, uh, how we actually understand this. I chose one of the shorter ones because it allows me to analyze the, the case of Bosnia and it I use the Beetham um, ones, which consists of um, two uh, basic components. It's the right to govern and then the recognition of, of this right uh, by people that are meant to be governed. So basically, it's this barbarian notion of rational legal type of legitimacy, which consists of the rule of law, accountability, transparency, delivery of public services, and confidence of the population. So pretty much all of the things that these two guys <laughs> talked about mm -hmm. that are being contested in the streets of Romania and Macedonia. And then this allows me to assess um, this concept in, in the field. The problem with Bosnia is that it's often hard to actually place what political legitimacy is in the country. So um, at the domestic level, we have the Dayton Constitution, which was internationally negotiated in 1995, and uh, which also gave, or in a way validated and legitimized, uh, the rule of ethno-national political parties within two entities of the country, Republika Srpska and the Federation. Some people refer to them as ethno-national fiefdoms. I don't think it's uh, as much the case as it used to be right after the war, but ethno-national political parties are still deeply ingrained in the political system of Bosnia. The problem comes with the international uh, governance that still exists in the country although uh, it is not really as active as it used to be. And that is the Office of the High Prosecutor, uh, sorry, Office of the High Representative. <laughs> I'll talk about prosecution later too. <laughs> office of the High Representative, uh, which uh, in 1998 was then, uh, which was basically created as a supervision uh, role of the Dayton Peace Agreement. And then in 1998, uh, the High Representative also, in a way, assigned to himself uh, the so-called bond powers, uh, which uh, allow him to sack politicians, uh, change le legislation, or impose decisions, which is which at some point, especially in the early 2000s, was, was a very crucial feature how to get any policies done in the country. Um, but on top of that, we have this very uh, interesting involvement of the European Union, which has been active, especially since um, it's been active in, in the past 10 years. 
And although it is not uh, constitutionally part of the system, it has a very powerful and strong financial and political leverage. So in a way, uh, it does govern Bosnia, although indirectly as well. So these, this way we create this hybrid governance that Bosnia functions on, where we have multiple contested sources of, of power and decision making. Um, in the literature, you know, we keep talking about Bosnia as what is this? Is it a democracy or is it a neo trusteeship, neo colony, and so on? Uh, a lot of authors would talk about the so called culture of dependency when you try to blame the shift for your decisions to someone else, either the internationals or the European Union, because it's such a complex system that it's actually quite easy, even across um, the country domestically. The main issue, of course, I will skip through this because I'm sure all of us are aware of this, is the stateness problem that Bosnia still has. And although I think Internally, among the population, if we look at survey data, this problem is decreasing. So uh, Serbs are increasingly more uh, reconciling with the fact that they live in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Bosniaks are more and more reconciling with the fact that Republika Srpska might become a part of that country for uh, a very long future. Uh, we still have problems with the fact that 50% of the population, which are, is da data from 2011, but data from 2014 is actually not much different, 50% of the population disagree with the fact that there is anything like a Bosnian nation. We can contest whether this is purely about identities or it's about uh, the identification with the state as such, but um, we, we certainly do have identity issues and identification with the state issues in the country. The interesting finding that I uh, recently came across is that within Bosnia, what is uh, most often being contested is the legitimacy of the constitution, so of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which in Annex 4 contains the constitution of the country. And you know, initially it was presented as it was an agreement about us, without us, we had no say in this constitution, it's, it's an imposition, it's an external imposition. And what it has ba become basically like an urban um, joke that anything that goes wrong in the country, it's Dayton to be blamed for, right? So. One of my respondents, for example, said that you know the fact that uh, there's stray dogs in Sarajevo, it, we blame it on Dayton. A friend of mine the, the other day was on TV, and the commentator asked him whether it's the fault of Dayton that the roads are bad. And he was like, well, of course, it's not the problem of the Dayton that the municipality is incompetent to fix the roads. You know, We have to stop putting blame on Dayton for everything. But interestingly, if you actually look at the survey data, and if you compare 2005 to 2015 data about how people actually feel about Dayton, the overwhelming majority of people will either think that it's positive on the side of Serbs, because of course it gave them replica Serbska, so they're quite happy with that, or they feel that it was necessary, but of course they have many reservations towards the individual clauses. But in a way, Dayton, although it is being you know, uh, bad mouth everywhere in, in the public sphere, people have lived with the fact that they need it, and they its it, its legitimacy is actually increasing rather than decreasing, uh, despite the discussions about constitutional reforms and so on. So let me go back to, as I said, the two components of the political legitimacy in the country. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at, uh, let's say, good governance in, in Bosnia, there are multiple ways how we can study it. And I'm giving you a little bit of an anecdotal evidence. Um, there, are, th there are different ways how we can actually look at it. but. Um, let me first look at elections. Um, the problem with elections is similar uh, in Bosnia. It's quite similar to the Macedonian case. Uh, it's the economic fear that, that drives the electoral choices that, that people make. So it's, you know, we could call it economic vote, and they're worried, worried about losing their jobs. So they keep vo voting for the same parties, which are unfortunately also the ethno-national political parties. Um, the turnout has dropped over the years, that is true. It's around 50%, which is quite low. It's one of the lowest uh, in, in Europe, but it's still not as low because actually I looked up data in Switzerland, turnout is usually around 48%. The country where I'm from, the Czech Republic, has usually a turnout of 65%. Um, so it depends uh, how we actually e evaluate only this particular figure. The problem is that also, um, as, as Tveta said, you know, with the, the Ohrid uh, agreement and with the framework that now exists in Macedonia, very similar with the Dayton framework that we have in Bosnia, it, it's quite hard to actually imagine that people would make different electoral choices with the current system that we have, which really gives power to, uh, gives reserved seats to uh, the so-called constituent peoples, and it, it does, uh, it is based on this uh, ethnic type of um, governance. If we look at uh, another, uh, again, uh, anecdotal type of piece of evidence on how bad or good governance works in Bosnia, public delivery. 
There's a wonderful uh, NGO in Bosnia which is called the Truthometer, Istinomir, which tries to measure um, the offset of electoral promises and their implementation. And I picked just one. So in 2015, this is data from 2015, out of the 458 electoral promises, only two were carried out in Republika Srpska. And the data is the same for the Federation. And they also have it divided. It's a beautiful website. They also have, you have to speak Bosnian though. They also have it divided by politicians. And they even look at, so they, whatever statement a politician would make in the media, they actually hold him accountable to it. And that is what has been missing until basically two years when this thing was set up. You wouldn't really have had that in the country. Another interesting one, uh, which I thought was just brilliant, only around 50% of taxes are collected in, in Bosnia, which is just absolutely appalling. Uh, reason for that is though that the overwhelming majority of Bosnians works in public services, only around 16% actually work in the private sector, the private which gathers the most taxes, uh, and because of the high levels of corruption, which I will talk about in, in a minute, this is basically the situation that we're faced with. Another interesting phenomena of the, of the last years is judicialization of politics, and Tvete talked about it um, as well. So what's happening that uh, because certain decisions are very uh, divisive in the society, they're being uh, presented to the courts to make decisions on them, uh, which, is, uh, which is meant to be the democratic way how to resolve issues. You have an um, independent arbiter who then decides on what the decision should be. The problem is that the arbiter actually makes the decision and those decisions are not implemented. So now we're faced with a situation of 2016 when 92 decisions of the constitutional court have not been implemented. And some of those decisions are no minor decisions. None of those are being implemented and there's no, um, no functioning in place how to actually implement them. The, the judicial institutions are highly contested. There's a referendum being called on uh, the legitimacy actually of the, uh, of the state court of Bosnia and Herzegovina on the, call of, uh, on, on the call of Republika Srpska leaders. So we can see that the judicialization of politics, though it was initially started as a nice way how to arbitrate uh, divisive uh, problems has actually uh, turned into one of the gravest problems that the country is now faced with. If we look at corruption in the country, um, so the image this, uh, just to fill you in, is a, is a leader of a coalition political party, Fahrudin Radoncic, sorry there's a, there's a mistake, it's without G at the end, Fahrudin Radoncic, uh, who was currently incarcerated uh, for a criminal case actually in Kosovo, but that, that does not really change much about his business involvements uh, in the country. Uh, he, uh, in, in a number of his brilliant statements, for example, said that even Mr. Čović, who is currently the president of the Bosnian presidency, came out of a six-month-long prison to become the member of the presidency, and he's fantastic in his job. Mr. Šarović, who was another minister and again uh, um, prosecuted for corruption, was behind the bars for nine months, and he has been the most successful minister in, in two governments. That someone is indicted does not mean that they're guilty. So basically what he's saying, in a way, and there's so many more of statements, similar statements, is that it's as if prison is your ticket to become a minister or member of the presidency in Bosnia. And you really, someone should do a statistical study on how many of them have been prosecuted for corruption. Most of them are, of course, let go because, um, yes, there is a lot of politicization of the judiciary, uh, but a lot of them have ended up in prison before they or during they actually held their offices. So basically, if we look at any corruption index that there is, um, the situation is quite bleak. Macedonia is actually worse off uh, on all of these indices. Um, so, for example, Transparency International gave Bosnia the score of 38 out of 100 points. So basically 100 is no, no corruption, zero is everything's corrupted. So Bosnia got 38, which is, which is pretty awful. Um, another interesting piece of evidence from the past uh, six months is that, as you might know, that in 2014, Bosnia was flooded. Currently, Serbia is flooded again, so we'll see what happens uh, with that. But... Uh, and a Bosnian NGO just uh, presented a report a couple of weeks ago that 50% of the foreign aid that was sent to the country went unaccounted for. And I actually myself organized uh, Balkan flood relief here at St. Antony's, but I made sure that I actually sent it directly to the people that I wanted it to be, to, because I knew that this was exactly happening. Even if you go through International Red Cross, money gets lost and no one ever find it. Another really uh, polarizing case that just recently happened was that the wife of uh, one of the members of the Bosnian presidency, Bati Rizabegovic, uh, was pretty much appointed the director of the main hospital in, in Sarajevo without 
any public discussion without any vote, she was pretty much the only feasible candidate. And the interesting bit is that this wasn't even, there was no even attempt to cover this up, to cover up what was actually happened. It was pretty much an open public, she's just appointed because she's his wife, so what do you want? This person here is actually Mr. Chovic, who spent six months in prison. Now he's the president of the presidency. Um, and uh, he usually makes really brilliant statements on how great the economy in Bosnia is. One of them is, I say that no one lives as well as we do. So let's hold him accountable to that. Um, so for example, uh, youth unemployment in the country is over 45%. The general unemployment is around 30%. Uh, and it's rising. Um, so it was, it was lower before the crisis hit uh, the Western Balkans, and Bosnia was badly hit by the world financial crisis. Uh, the GDP per capita has not only been stagnating, but it has actually dropped uh, by a little bit, but it has dropped in the past few years. Uh, so the, the, the numbers that I have here is from 2013, nearly 18% of the Bosnian population lives on less than uh, 213 euro per month. And the country is not a it's an upper, um, I think in the World Bank economic uh, in the indices, it's, um, it's an upper middle income type of country. So, you know, consu consumer goods are actually quite expensive in Bosnia. But it's interesting to see what's actually behind this picture. I know it's in, in, uh, in Bosnia, but so for example, um, bottom left, it says we are hungry in three languages. Uh, we're, we're hunger striking. Uh, so only so that uh, young people get uh, their jobs. And those were actually posters that were used in 2014 during protests that I will get to in a, in a little bit. So I'm just, I'm just trying to put a little bit of flavor on uh, how accountable actually politicians are, not only to what they say, but to what they do. The other legitimacy which, which Sveta talked about is the legitimacy of the external actors, of the international community. So as I said, the, the high representative's office uh, has been paralyzed uh, for multiple global political reasons because Russia is of course part of this picture as well and the bond powers were used for the last time in 2012. There is also no sunset clause so no one really knows how long this institution will function within Bosnia and it's a bit of an no one's really sure about what to do with it, no one's really sure about how, what it can do or what it should do. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's one of the most unpopular institutions in the country in the, in the past years. Uh, the problem with the European Union, which is again, as in, in the case of Macedonia, been looked at as you know, the, the driver of reforms and the democratizer and so on, is that it has been extremely inconsistent uh, in its application of reforms and demands on Bosnia. So increasingly it has seen as not credible. So it has shifted its focus from human rights to uh, economic and labor rights to this so-called famous reform agenda that was launched in 2014. Nonetheless, because there really is no other option, uh, the European Union is still quite popular among the population. But the problem is that this popularity is not uh, uniform across the country. So if you look at statistics within Republika Srpska, the feeling about do we want in the European Union is much, much, much lower than it is in the Federation. Uh, what also happened recently, which was actually a month ago, or not even that, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, was that Bosnia and Herzegovina submitted its EU application. Uh, and again, this gentleman on the left, that is the gentleman that spent six months in prison, that's the president of the presidency, Dragan Čović, who basically used this opportunity to legitimize his uh, electoral campaign, which is gonna start pretty soon because the, the local elections are starting, uh, are, are gonna take place in October. Um, right after the submission of this application, um, this entire story of EU, um, Bosnia fulfilling a lot of uh, conditions was uh, highly contested in public. Republika Srpska even voiced its opposition to the actual submission of the application. They felt that they were tricked by the creation of a coordination mechanism of which they were completely not, not part of. So even on the international side, we have uh, quite a lot of problems regarding legitimacy. So now if you look at how people actually view all of these issues and what are the perceptions of the public and what are the public actually recognizes those who govern them. So this is one of the, uh, I, I always find these uh, statistics really interesting to see what is the confidence of the population in various institutions. So actually, actually if you look at the bottom, most of the, forget about the ICTY, that's problematic, but most of the, the governing institutions, so Office of the High Representatives, uh, down to political parties, extremely low levels of legitimacy. Interestingly, police has really high uh, uh, confidence of the public, European Union, and religious leaders. And I think others will agree that 
religion is one of those aspects that we still haven't really capitalized on in those countries as much as we potentially could have. But anyhow, this gives you a picture on how much legitimacy those uh, political actors within the system actually have. And I want to use this, uh, this, it's a theoretical concept of exit and voice, how the public actually engages with, uh, with those that, that govern them. So it's based on a, a few authors, there's multiple more of them. And um, the concept is based on uh, exit and voice. So exit means either physical uh, migration from the country where you are, uh, or you withdraw yourself from the public sphere. And there's multiple ways well, how we can look at it, how we can measure it. So in the case of Bosnia, the net migration really is on the rise. Uh, net migration means that you, um, there's more people uh, leaving than coming uh, into the country. There's multiple reasons for that. One of them is most certainly the economic crisis. Uh, the other one is that uh, a, quite a lot of the population in the Republika Srpska, it's, it's estimated around 40% or even more, and over 60% of the population in, in, in Herzegovina have dual citizenships, which also means that they really gravitate outside of Bosnia. They gravitate either to Croatia or to Serbia. I already talked about the voter turnout, but that's also a way of exit. Sim you simply withdraw yourself from any type of public engagement. But there's also a, a very threatening type of exit, which uh, the, the, the president of, of Replika Srpska, Milorad Dodik, is threatening with, with, which is the referendum on first the judiciary and, you know, the, the, the referendum on, on uh, Replika Srpska's independence is always there in the air. Everyone knows that it's impossible to happen, but nonetheless, it's still part of the, the public, sp uh, public sphere and public discussions. Now voice, which is basically what my predecessors were talking about mostly, is uh, that's where we, when we talk about protests and social mobilization. Uh, contentious politics really has been part of uh, Bosnian politics for quite a long time, although we never really talked about it as much as uh, we probably should have. And it's usually various type of associations, uh, victim associations, veteran associations, parents, youth, and so on. Since 2005, there was quite a popular movement called Enough. In 2013, we saw a giant uh, uh, protest uh, within Sarajevo because the country was unable to issue something as simple as birth certificates. Uh, so this resulted as the so-called baby revolution, uh, baby revolution, or baby revolution. Um, that actually took a few months until that issue was resolved, and it was basically a pretext for what happened in February 2014, when Bosnia experienced the widest type of social mobilization <coughs> since the end of the war uh, in 1995. And it, similarly to what Sveta said, it was interesting to see that you know, people would uh, come out with slogans such as we are hungry in three languages, meaning we speak all the same language and we know it and we're not stupid. You need to stop telling us that we speak three different languages because no, it's, we understand each other. This country has only one language in a way. It's just called differently. But this was a protest against the corrupt politicians, about privatization, about politics in a way what Gruya was saying. Again, this dirty type of politics that we want to withdraw ourselves from. Uh, and um, the, but the problem with the protest was that it hasn't really uh, crystallized into anything that would be able to become a, some sort of a challenge to the political establishment. But you know, even now, uh, what is it? Two years later, these plenums, which basically resulted from those uh, from those uh, protests, which were supposed to be public forums where people would discuss all of these things, even now these plenums are still happening in some parts of the country. Uh, there was recently a political party created in Tuzla, uh, which is, has this uh, image of a very uh, civic uh, or civil uh, place uh, with liberal values. And this party was actually a direct result of uh, the, the social protests. I am quite skeptical uh, about you know, what actually came out of the protest, but if you talk to a lot of those who were part of th those protests, to them it was a great learning exercise. To them they learned the mistakes of uh, how to not to or involve with politics, how to be able to strike, how to be able to mobilize uh, a lot of people across the country. So in a way it was a learning exercise and it was the first time that we've seen anything like that. So although it hasn't really resulted in anything as tangible as we would have hoped observing those uh, protests back then, maybe there's still hope. Uh, we have now a series of watchdogs in the country that are really reliant on various types of funding and so on. Uh, that try to hold politicians accountable, as I say, uh, and that come with independent platforms to voice ideas. So if I go back actually to the original question of, of this session, 
uh, are we experiencing a crisis of political legitimacy in all of these countries? I think I agree with Tveta that um, it's not as much a crisis as it is uh, because crisis is in a way a perpetual uh, phenomenon in, in those countries that we're talking about. It's just a matter of which type of crisis we're talking, we're talking about. What happens, I think, in the case of Bosnia is that after 2006, when the international actors have uh, tried to withdraw themselves and started this talk about local ownership, is that local politicians have come under more spotlight. Um, and then uh, with the advent of uh, the EU accession process and the reforms and so on, they have become increasingly worried about you know, the sanitary effect that they could potentially also end up in jail if a rule of law reforms, uh, reforms and so on uh, would actually be implemented. So the, the crisis that is happening is actually within the political elites of Bosnia and Herzegovina right now and the fact that since a few years back they are being increasingly more hold, uh, held accountable, accountable by, uh, by the citizens uh, which we saw in the planners, which we saw during the protests and which we keep seeing now. There's still multiple types of protests happening around the country. Um, and uh, I think I'm not entirely sure again, uh, similar to Tveta, what is the power alternative that we have here. But I'm still quite hopeful seeing uh, a lot of young people returning back to Bosnia uh, after the protests and you know, trying to become actually members of some sort of alternative movements. Whether they will be successful is questionable at the moment, uh, since we still have the data and structures in place and since this country still functions on the basis of ethno-national structures. And until that is overhauled, I'm not entirely sure how they could actually find any space, any political voice within the system. Nonetheless, you know, we might be wrong. So that would be my hopefully hopeful um, conclusion. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, it's just some, so these are still the local small programs that are happening around the country. So. Thank you all.